Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everybody that's uh, on the East Coast and uh, still marginally good morning here in, in WA. Um, great opportunity to share this really exciting story at a time when uranium and nuclear are absolutely booming. It's something that is certainly not new to me. I've been in the industry off and on for many, many years and have been indirectly involved in uranium for as long as I can remember in my career. So really an exciting time with an exciting project going really forward. If we can skip through to page three, sometimes I use this particular slide to bookend my presentation to highlight the value opportunity that is uh, Aurora Energy Metals and the scale of our deposit. When it comes to assessing deposits and, and, and companies that have projects at the advanced stage uh, exploration uh, phase, it's always really important to highlight quality over just pure quantity. And that's why I've had this graph created where we look at the chart of the people that have measured and indicated as opposed to inferred resources. You know, years ago, early on in my career, I had a seasoned campaigner with a sort of wagging a finger at me saying, listen here, sonny boy, you know, inferred resources are just a rumor. And, uh, and sometimes that turns out to be very true, even with companies that have transacted at, at, at major, major numbers. In the end, the deposits, the projects are never delivered because they were based on inferred or, or, or maybe just uh, indicated uh, deposits or, or resources. So lots of upside when you compare ourselves to the other companies out there and the sorts of valuations that they are tra attracting per pound in the ground of resource. If we can just go over to uh, next slide, please. So our investment proposition, and normally this is a blue background, but anyways, it's a bit stark and wakes you up to see that bright white uh, chart now. Uh, five key aspects. First of all, the quality and the scale of the deposit. The fact that we have really good infrastructure and we have a very clear pathway to development. And you'll know, I'll explain why that is particularly relevant uh, later on in my presentation. One of the best, one of the world's best jurisdictions from a nuclear perspective, as well as from a mining and a permitting perspective with very clear permitting paths going forward. And nobody overnight, uh, unlike WA and Queensland, uh, is going to ban uranium mining just on some ideological whim. A whim. It's all clear, laid down, and it's legal. Really important to, to realize that. And I've already started with that first slide, and I'll book in with the end slide as well about the compelling valuation. If we can just go into the corporate sna snapshot, please. Next slide. Uh, so briefly, a very small team. That's just the board and our CFO, uh, Peter Lester, extensive experience um, globally, uh, similar background to myself, um, corporate development, uh, uranium, lithium, plus transactional experience, similar to mine as well. So a great person to have on the board. Uh, whilst L is one of the individuals, uh, partners in Mitchell River Group, that was actually the group that originally acquired this deposit back in 2010 from uh, my original, what one of the companies I was at the time uh, was Uranium One. I had nothing to do with the US. I was running Australia and Asia. In fact, I permitted Honeymoon, which is today's boss energy, of course. Uh, so funny how things turn full circle. Uh, one little bit of perspective in terms of where the market can go when it comes to uranium. Um, when Uranium One acquired this deposit, it was part of a company called Energy Metals, not the ASX listed Energy Metals, but a TSX listed Energy Metals. And they acquired Energy Metals in July 2007 for 1.6 billion US dollars. It's not the value of our asset, clearly. Uh, there were other ISR projects in the mix, but it just goes to show where the, the uranium market can actually get to in a very short space of time. Um, as far as the, the investment spread, obviously our founders from Mitchell River Group have a sizable proportion. And since we listed uh, in May last year, no sales from the Mitchell River Group, and they continue to support us, but they don't have the financial wherewithal to back us into the future. And that's why we've got some really good institutions, domestically, uh, you know, well-known um, uh, uranium funds focused, uh, such as Tribeca and uh, and obviously Paradise. So uh, very supportive shareholders, um, plus a large group of, of uh, say, you know, international and domestic uh, investors as well. Okay, on to the next one. 
Coming back briefly to the scale question, and there's two aspects or two ways to look at the scale of this particular resource. So it is, and this is undeniable fact, otherwise I wouldn't be saying it, it is the largest mineable measured and indicated uranium deposit in the USA. But when we look at the whole of the resource, the 107 odd million tons, we'd be the first to acknowledge that the grade is on the lowest side. Um, and that's why we are focused on this very shallow, very easily mineable high grade core that's almost 20 million tons that runs at just below 500 ppm. So when you put that onto a, onto a chart and you compare that to the other conventional deposits in the USA, whether you're looking at the high grade core or the overall deposit itself, you can see where we sit compared to our peers in the USA. Coles Hill's big, can't be mined. They've had a 40-year moratorium in Virginia. That high-grade portion that we're focusing on, by the way, is 91% measured, 99.5% measured and indicated. This is a deposit that has no remaining geological risk at all. Uh, over to the next slide, please. Right here, uh, some of the other key points to note in terms of our location there in southeast Oregon, just on the border with, with Nevada. In fact, the little town of McDermott is kind of like 80% in McDermott, sorry, in Nevada, and maybe 20% uh, in Oregon. So it's a, it's a sparsely populated rolling grasslands, some hills and background, but you know, it's no, this is not a bus, bustling metropolis, but it is. A historical mining district and was so from you know the early 1920s to the early 1990s and being the closest to the town we benefit from that that historical infrastructure um, which works really well in our favor in terms of access to the mine site as well as our plant site which is on private land and i'll let more about that in the next slide but i won't go there yet the other aspect that i'd like to highlight is previously when the company was listed um, pre Fukushima, uh, its market cap on a significantly smaller resource was in excess of $100 million. Some great test work was done to demonstrate the potential for a reject step where you can process and beneficiate, get rid of 30% of the plant feed while still recovering 90% of the uranium. And that would mean that you get a much higher grade feed going into your um, plant, which reduces your energy consumption and your reagent consumption, and therefore your overall uh, processing costs. And this is a project that will be driven by processing costs because the mining costs will be negligible given the very shallow, easy, mineable nature of the resource. On to the next one, please. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have this clear pathway to development, and this is a very important fact. And you know, when some of our U.S. Uh, investors came on board, this was the the U.S.P. This was the unique selling point that got them over the line and convinced them to invest, because they know that Oregon is a tree hugging state. Got some magnificent wine you know, vineyards uh, in, on the West Coast, um, the Willamette Valley. I never heard of Willamette Valley until I got involved in this magnificent Pinot like you've never tasted before. So there's a hint for, for some upside. Um, but, you know, where we are, uh, just right in the corner between Idaho and Nevada and Oregon, not much going on. And that works in our favor because the Salem, the government and Portland people aren't particularly interested in what's going on on the other side of the state. Number one. Number two, sparsely populated. Number three, the district senator who I had dinner with the last time I was there in February and the representative desperately want development. And here we have the solution where we can permit a mine, just an aggregate quarry, effectively in Oregon, but we're going to build the plant on private land in Nevada that has a substation on the one corner that is fed by hydroelectricity from Oregon. And that's very appealing because it simplifies our permitting process. Oregon knows how to permit aggregate quarries. They've done it before. And in fact, uh, International Minerals was an ASX listed entity that permitted a mineral sands mine there not too long ago. They built the mine, um, but 
the market tanked and they went out of business. But it demonstrates that Aussies can permit mines that don't do sophisticated chemical processing in Oregon. We'll do that all in Nevada, one of the world's great mining jurisdictions. And I know the one question will come up is, how can you do that? Can you ship radioactive material across borders? There is no legal impediment to shipping ore from one state to another in the US. And in fact, those that are aware of US historical uranium industry back or background, um, the whole industry was based on that premise going back to the 60s and the 70s, where you had centralized processing plants built being fed by satellite mines all over the place. And they would send their ore intra or interstate, uh, either or, or for that matter, um, partially processed material as well. So as we speak today, because US is the largest nuclear fleet in the world, there's something like 2 million shipments of radioactive radioactive material across the country on an annual basis. So that, that's no impediment at all. So very exciting to be able to position this pathway to development um, because it resolves the question around permitting, but also opens up a great avenue to low, clean, low cost, clean, green, and sustainable energy to drive our plant. And private land, as anybody who's dealt in the US knows, is so much easier to permit stuff compared to federal land. The mine itself is on federal so-called BLM, Bureau of Land Management uh, land. Over to the next slide, please. Won't spend too much time on this. There's just a, a passing comment when you look at the left-hand side, the map showing, you know, obviously plan view of the scale of the resource. So it is of significant aerial extent. Uh, and then to the right, the section and all I'm going to highlight there in the section is if you look to the right of that section, you can see some holes drilled indicating that there is resource upside. We're not focused on resource upside at the moment. We can deliver um, a, a mine that can produce for 10 to 12 years, somewhere between one and a half and two million pounds per annum. That's almost unheard of in US history, where typically the mines were smaller, little pod like affairs. So that is appealing. The time for us now is right to develop the asset, complete the studies, rather than trying to expand the resource space. If we move on to the next slide, I can give you a bit more context in terms of what the section means to the mineability of the resource uh, and, and the processability of that beneficiation step. So first of all, the thing to notice is it's shallow and there's very little overburden. Funny enough, the overburden is colored in, in, in light blue. That was unintentional, um, but it, it is former lake bed dried out now, but lake bed sediments. And those are the same lake bed sediments that host Jindalee's mega lithium deposit, some 12 kilometers to the west of us, as well as the famous uh, Thacker Pass owned by um, Lithium Americas, which is currently under development. So, the message there is, well, we know we've got overburden. We know we've got lithium in the overburden. They are geologically discrete. So it's not as if we're going to mine lithium and, you know, your batteries, although they do catch a light, but that's got nothing to do with uranium, of course, as we know. Um, your batteries will not glow in the dark. Our focus, though, is not on the lithium, despite the fact that we know it there because it takes time and a lot of money to drill out an asset, uh, drill out a resource. Whereas here we have this very well-defined uranium deposit. The yellow stuff is the harder um, original volcanic material, the rhyolites, basalts, etc. Whereas the red material is the higher grade altered material, which is soft. And that's why beneficiation works. So you can easy strip, bulk mine, feed it into a plant, and you let the hard, low-grade stuff do the work in the scrubber to crush the altered high-grade material you put it over screen, you reject the low grade stuff, and you've got the sweet stuff straight into your plant. Thanks. If we can go on to the next slide. This is just one conceptual view of what that may look like. Um, very basic, and you can see a sense of, you know, we're not surrounded by a metropolis. So we're out in the open. Um, no major issues with regards to game and things like that. We have some sensitive areas that we need to address but nothing material, certainly nothing that's a fatal flaw, given that this was a historical mining district. Open pit, 
overburden stockpile of which some of that would be segregated because it would be lithium containing and workshops. If you look at the conceptual plant layout, we may do the beneficiation step at the mine or we may do it at the plant some 10 or 12 kilometers away. And that depends on our choice, ultimate choice of transport system. And we have a number of options that we are just about to assess as in the trade or study as part of our scoping study, which is underway at the moment. Over to the next one. Um, you can skip this. I, I spoke about the uranium uh, and the nuclear, you know, the tailwinds in nuclear, and that the US is still the largest or has the largest nuclear fleet in the world. And that will remain so until around about 2030 or so, maybe slightly earlier, when China will take over. What that means, of course, self evident that they're the world's largest uranium consumer, but they have almost no uranium production. And just like the other critical minerals for the battery sector, they're desperate to re-establish their, their domestic supply of uranium and overall their, their nuclear fuel chain. And when you look at the numbers and the charts below, they say the same thing in terms of at least the one provides some bit more of a history in terms of where we're going in terms of surpluses dropping into sustained long-term supply gaps, building up very rapidly. And we've seen numbers of one and a half billion pounds in a 180 million pound a year market, shortfall by 2040. But it's more urgent than that in the US because of their desperate need for domestically sourced uranium. And that's where we fit in. So the US utilities find the, the, the opportunity that there is a significant uh, aspiring uranium developer that has that is production visible in this decade is very appealing. Thanks very much. On to the next slide. Here's what we're looking to do and our current program looking forward into the future where I mentioned we're busy with a scoping study. The two relevant pieces of work at the moment are MET test work, which is underway at ALS, the, the metallurgical labs here in Perth. Uh, it took us a bit of time to get the sample, the ton sample from the US to here, but at least it's underway now. As well as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the, the, the transport trade-off, um, there's a cool slide in, in the appendix, but I won't refer to that now, showing some glorious, very fascinating technology that could be used to cost-effectively and clean and efficiently transport the ore across the border. So the scoping study we're aiming to complete by the end of the year. So there's all these intermittent news flow around MET test work, the trade-off analyses, et cetera. And then the plan is to go straight into the PFS, uh, aiming to complete the scoping study by the end of the year, or maybe in Q1, because we started the, the, the test work a little bit late, but still a hard line target for completing the PFS at the end of next year. Why do I stress that? Because that's the, the, the trigger point for commencing the process to apply for the mine operating permit in Oregon, and the processing permit in Nevada. And that runs in parallel with the definitive feasibility study. And that's exactly the same as companies such as Thacker Pass or our own uh, you know, iron ear with Rhylite Ridge. Bernard Rose done a fantastic job, but he's shown us the way and how that can be done. The permitting that goes on in parallel currently is around being able to do bulk sampling and things like that. And that requires what's called an expiration plan of operations. And we can look to Jinder Lee because they're in the process of finalizing theirs now. They've done it. They're just doing the community engagement bit. And we're starting that with the baseline environmental studies, which are due to commence just early next week, in fact. Uh, so that's getting going. And that those baseline studies are valid, not just for this phase, but also for the operational phase. There's that light blue section in lithium. The only focus for us on lithium is finding a credible partner to actually progress that on our behalf whilst we focus on this great uranium asset. Um, I think we're almost at the end there. Just one more slide. And there we come full close to where I started off in terms of the value opportunity shown in two different ways. First of all, you know, compared to our peers just in the bar chart and then the bubble chart as well. And whether you look at our position, the holistic um, resource or just that high grade piece of the resource, we compare very favorably, which the final slide to go one more 
Um, that's why we are a compelling investment opportunity in the uranium space with those key attributes. Thanks very much for your time and your attention. Yeah, thanks, Greg. A uh, great uh, presentation. Now, I did warn you uh, about an hour ago, this question was coming up. Look, uh, Greg, it's been well documented. Uranium prices have skyrocketed and they're now at their highest levels for 12 years. We'd love to hear your thoughts on what you see as the key drivers uh, to this price action and whether they're sustain sustainable. Yeah, and it is an excellent question and, and an understandable and common question. And, and yes, I do believe they are sustainable. The things that are driving it are the realization that for the last, well, first of all, the uranium and nuclear industry has never been driven by rational, normal mineral economics principles. There's always been an oversupply. There's always been a readily accessible above ground supply, um, which has now come to an end. And all of a sudden, people are waking up to the fact that there needs to be an incentive price to produce uranium to keep the lights on in these nuclear fleets across the globe. So that's a very important step, is that for the first time in history, rational economics is starting to prevail. They can see this supply shortfall, and it's only getting worse. In the short term, from a supply point of view, we've also seen trouble in, in, in Kazakhstan, a place that I ran on behalf of, of uh, Uranium One in my Uranium One days, I was head of, of Australia and Asia, fantastic place to mine. But they faced their own challenges. First of all, they had obviously the upsets in, in January this year, social upsets, plus the complication of their transport route is through Russia and out St. Petersburg. So that brings into question the accessibility, long-term future accessibility of Kazakh supply, the world's largest producer. Secondly, in the short term, both Kazanimprom and Kamiko just recently announced supply shortfalls. So they're going on to the spot market to actually buy uranium to fill their contracts. And the third aspect, of course, is those physical uranium funds. One run by a former colleague of mine from my bulletin days, Andre Lindberg, Yellow Cake, they were the first. But of course, the big daddy of them all now is Sprott. When Sprott commits to something, they do it big. And boy, have they done. You know, I can't remember the number, but they probably at close to 70 million pounds. Um, the interesting thing is that drove spot prices last year. This year, They've only recently entered the market. So this ramp up that we've seen in the spot price has nothing to do with the physical uranium holding funds. It has to do with fundamental supply and demand. So absolutely, this is sustainable. I haven't even mentioned the, you know, the, 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 the recognition globally, apart from a number of backward countries, um, Australia and Germany to name two, who think that they can do things with renewables which are physically impossible. They have their place. The starting point for sustainable clean energy absolutely is nuclear. No debate, no question, but we it's a debate we still have to have. Hopefully, it'll become more mature yeah. um, in Australia, but absolutely. So, you know, the US talking about 300 small modular reactors by 2040, 2050. You know, it, it's just mind-boggling what's going on out there. And it's probably fair to say that you know, with with you know, with the uranium price where it is, you know, conversations that you're going to be having with the U.S. government permitting, hopefully that's going to be beneficial to to those conversations because bringing new production online is obviously uh, going to greatly benefit the uh, the U.S. Yeah, yeah. And offhand, I struggle to think of any U.S. operation that was ever a single operation was ever of that scale. I'm I'm sure there must have been a few, but but not not many. You know, I, I, I like to quote a statistic in in 1980 odd U.S. peak production was 40 odd 44 41 million pounds. There were 384 licensed inverted commas uranium mines. Clearly, those aren't uranium mines that would be permitted today. That's rats and mice that is just unacceptable that leave legacy environmental issues. So you need to be, have scale in order to deliver a sound, clean environmentally acceptable operation. Okay, just a couple more. When can we expect to see results from the, the uh, uranium samples that uh, you sent to the, uh, to, to the lab? And what yeah, do you so, hope to see from those results? Yeah, so they're not assays. We've published all the assays, so that is in the public domain. This is metallurgical test work. So a, a comprehensive test work program has been designed. 
Um, and we've had the benefit of, of DRA Global that have excellent uranium people, funny enough, based in, in, in South Africa. Uh, they've got good people in Perth as well, but the, their uranium expertise has largely resides in, in Africa. Uh, and they've done work in uranium all across the globe. So we use them, plus a, an independent consultant that we've used and I've used before in, in previous uh, roles in Deep Yellow, et cetera, to work together to design this detailed metallurgical test work program. The objectives, recreate that 30% reject beneficiation step, and then focus, take you know, the, the, the product from that beneficiation, and then focus on the leach test work to devise what the potential flow sheet looks like. So, you know, I showed that, that flow sheet on slide 11. That's just one idea, one option. It's a credible option, but there may be others out there. Um, and, you know, so we will piecemeal in the coming months be releasing those results. They're not assays per se. They are results that, oh, we are achieving or obtaining a 25 or a 35 percent reject and this is the sizing of the reject and this is the implications for the next step in the process whilst also reporting back on um, the um, the trade-off the, the the transport trade-offs as well as the ongoing permitting for the exploration plan of operations greg it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on today absolutely fascinating story one i'll be keeping a very close eye on I must say, I'm a bit gobsmacked at your market cap with the opportunity you got, but uh, hopefully investors out there uh, feel the same way and they know what they can do about it. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been banging the drum really aggressively for the last three, three and a half months saying, this is it, this is it, look at this, you know, you know and, uh, and I think the message is now getting through. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, have a great weekend and thanks for your time today. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Paul. Take care.